Thank you, um, Excellency Blasi. I'd like to welcome everybody to this morning's session, a very important session. As uh, His Excellency has just uh, explained, migration is really a um, very current topic for not just Europe or the Mediterranean, but it is for all the world. And uh, I would like to uh, start my contribution today by thanking His Excellency Jean-Paul Cateron and his team of Cross-Montana Forum for giving us this opportunity to share our thoughts and vision about the challenges and opportunities being faced by many nations as a result of migration. I would like to start by sharing my concern with you about the increasingly negative rhetoric which is surrounding the phenomenon of migration. In recent years, a troubling discourse has serviced throughout many nations. Such inadequate discourse cannot be ignored. I believe that we must be especially vigilant about such negative attitudes at this crucial time in our history. However, most importantly, we must remember that this sense of unease and these threats of division are unfortunately not new to many nations. Scapegoating others, especially those whom we perceive to be different from ourselves, is a first step towards the most extreme forms of social ex exclusion and towards encouraging the most dangerous populist ideologies. Humanity must not forget the lessons of history. We must encourage everyone across the globe to recognize that migration has been part of our past, it is part of our present, and will be part of our future. We must acknowledge that humanity has always been on the move for different reasons. We must therefore remember that short-sighted perspectives which see migration only as a source of upheaval are in the long term immensely damaging to the sustainable peace and prosperity of our world. According to the latest indicators from United Nations, the number of international migrants stands at around 244 million, and people on the move are greater in number than births in the whole global population. The world cannot afford to ignore the incredible potential of so many people of all genders, ethnicities, and generations, and their contributions to our societies. I believe that, as an international community, we must do more to explore the complex causes of migration and to respond to the factors which drive it. There is a need for us to respond to the root causes of precarity, poverty, and conflict, which force so many people to leave their homes, many unwillingly. However, it is a necessity for them to do so, to save their lives or find a better life. We must admit that although many initiatives and substantial funds are afforded to countries, particularly those experiencing poverty and precarity, we need to ensure that such resources and humanitarian aid are actually used to make an effective investment. We, mo we must not just spend by throwing money at the problem. Money needs to be invested to create an appropriate environment for proper education and training, dignify job opportunities, and facilities to adapt to climate change in line with the 2015 Paris Agreement. These are just a few ideas, and I am confident that during your deliberations today, you will identify more necessities for investment. On the other hand, let us admit that migration has played an essential role in the development of our world. However, the reasons behind migration are changing. For example, issues of climate change and regional unrest cannot be ignored as root causes for people to move. The world should not be complacent to see whole countries being dilapidated of their peoples, especially in particular regions such as Africa and the Middle East. 
the international community needs to be more proactive and take further action now. Above all, we must admit also that the phenomenon of migration is also providing positive opportunities for the regeneration and growth across many of our nations. Let me take an example of a success, successful attitude towards migration. Germany is a typical example of how humanitarian considerations have been addressed while also encouraging migrant participation in the workforce to support its economy and welfare system. Indeed, according to recent data from the World Economic Forum, migrants already make up between 15 to 20 percent of the working age population in many of the world's advanced economies. A study entitled The Impact of Migration, released by the International Monetary Fund last year, clearly shows that over the longer term, migrating workers of diverse skill sets are bringing substantial benefits to high-level economies. Not only do their contributions increase income per person, but living standards are seen to improve as well. Migrants who have higher skills are making their talents available to the marketplace, thereby ensuring that their expertise is integrated into existing competencies. The contribution of high-skilled migrants are of direct and complementary benefit to our communities and our societies. On the other hand, let us call a spade a spade. I have, a, I have come across migrants in various countries, have high skill, skill, high level skills and qualifications who are experiencing exclusion from dignified work, which they deserve. This happens due to prejudice and discrimination. In fact, they are being engaged in jobs which native populations are discarding. Such jobs are also being made available to lower skilled migrants who are performing occupations of critical importance. Furthermore, the impact of low-skilled migrants is significant because of the way they complement the overall productivity of a nation's population. Thanks to these layers of complementarity, our economies are capable of functioning more efficiently and effectively, filling gaps in the infrastructures of our nations. The facts, the facts make it clear that migration, through its multidimensional impact, can make good economic sense. We must therefore continue to reassert that migrants are essential collaborators to maintain a healthy and sustainable workforce in advanced economies. This is particularly necessary in the light of the shrinking working age population, which is being experienced, for example, across Europe and in much of the Western world. A specific example of this are indicators from Eurostat for the 28 EU countries, which says, and I will quote, the proportion of people of working age in the EU 28 is shrinking, while the relative number of those retired is expanding. The share of older persons in the total population will increase significantly in the coming decades. And here I end the quote. Without steady and well-managed sources of migration, the productivity and prosperity of EU economies will suffer. Therefore, we cannot allow the discourse around migration to be hijacked by a short-sighted perspective. Rather, we must work together in solidarity to find ways of managing migration flows more successfully by addressing the root causes of migration. I believe that we must find innovative approaches to managing migration in, in such a way that supports our national needs and infrastructures, that creates stronger alliances and networks between our different nations, and that safeguards the fundamental human rights of migrants themselves, and also ensuring that native populations do not suffer due to lack of a level playing field, particularly in the world of work. It is a matter of national interest to promote strategies for the inclusion of new workers into our economies. I am also convinced that our economic interests will never be achieved unless they are also met by an equal investment in human potential. 
This will only be possible when we promote the successful and respectful inclusion of migrants within our society. Such strategies for inclusion must be part of a global social solidarity approach which recognizes the essential value of migrants by the participation within our communities as respective contributors and collaborators towards one common goal of peace, prosperity, and well-being. For this reason, we must ensure that the peoples of our nations are not overwhelmed by an, en by an angry rhetoric of exclusion and division. It is true that no nation can tackle the complex and multidimensional factors of migration alone. As was stated many times during Malta's presidency of the Council of the European Union, it is essential that our nations continue to build solid partnerships, in particular between the countries that are most exposed to substantial migration flows. There is an urgent need for our countries to show solidarity with one another, especially at times of crisis. For this reason, we must respond to the call currently being made by Italy to share the enormous load of increased migration by effectively supporting them. We must form international relationships which are based on mutual trust in order to ensure that our international responses to the phenomenon of migration are a team effort. Let me reiterate that we must invest in effective strategies rather than simply throw money at the issue. Our resources must be focused where they will do the most good by working in synergies to effectively manage migration flows and where necessary to provide essential humanitarian assistance. We must ensure that migrants are not permitted to fall victim to exploitation and modern day slavery while they're on their, way, on their journeys through countries of transit or destination. Nor should they suffer at the hands of exploitative employers. Some of the most pressing challenges being posed by migration within our societies are often the result of unsuccessful or incomplete inclusion policies. These have repercussions on all areas of a country's social, economic, and cultural life. For example, we should consider the escalating precarity, as reported by indicators from the International Monetary Fund, that is ex being experienced in some of our nation's urban areas. It is in these areas that employment opportunities are more numerous, and there is therefore a resulting density of migrant workers. Migrants who are active in more informal sectors of business, industry, and services often find themselves being absorbed into city infrastructures, which are sometimes unable to support their effective inclusion. Therefore, I believe that we must collaborate to create specific strategies for inclusion within urban environments. Let us take every opportunity to share best practices and take a city-level approach which focuses our attention on the experiences of migra migrants and native communities themselves. In this way, we shall be listening to the concerns, experiences, and aspirations of all stakeholders. Indeed, we shall be gaining valuable insight into their situations and exploring concrete paths forward. For this reason, we must continue to emphasize the role of structured processes of democratic participation, which are a cornerstone of our democracies. We must celebrate the opportunities that diversity brings by listening to one another and by taking action in response to the information that we gain. My experiences in Malta have shown me that a lack of dialogue between communities is often at the root of so much conflict and distrust. For example, through consultations carried out by my foundation, that is the President's Foundation for the Wellbeing of Society, with diverse migrant and refugee groups in Malta, it became apparent that many of these individuals and their families were finding it difficult to connect with the native population on a social level. However, thanks to the efforts, active efforts, made by civil society organizations, opportunities for relationship building and community level connections 
have begun to take shape, resulting in more social cohesion and a growing sense of inclusion. While it is essential to implement bottom-up strategies for social inclusion, our plans cannot be limited to local or national efforts alone. We must take advantage of all opportunities, such as today's meeting, to have a regional and international impact. Our responses to the phenomenon of migration must, at every level, reinforce a strong sense of good governance and faith in the rule of law. For this reason, we must promote a rights-based approach which upholds the intrinsic dignity of the many individuals who migrate in search of peace, prosperity, and well-being. A strong emphasis on universal human rights must be at the heart of all our efforts to achieve global social solidarity alongside sustainable economic development. When we accept that processes of migration are bringing substantial benefits to our economies, then we must also commit ourselves to strategies for respectful socio-economic inclusion. I believe that some of the most urgent and practical actions which we must take as part of this multi-level approach to migration include cultural training and language learning, support for migrants who are searching for employment, more efficient ways of recognizing the existing qualifications and skills portfolios of migrants when they arrive in a destination country, and more effective gateways into employment and entrepreneurship. Such efforts must be paralleled by an equally strong investment in the native populations of our nations. We must boost the confidence that our people have in the effectiveness of our economies and the role of migration to safeguard our success. This can be achieved by ensuring that our native populations have increased opportunities for further education, that they are exposed to awareness campaigns about the benefits of diversity and the economic strength which it brings, and the upgrading of our workers' skills into new and innovative sectors of the economy. Moreover, I believe that our authorities and policymakers must make a determined effort to ensure that essential public services are not overburdened as a result of changing demographics. The provision of adequate health care, infrastructural support, and educational services must be effectively regulated in order to avoid social tensions and the risk of radicalization and conflict. On concluding, let me once again say that the real struggle we are facing is not about whether migration is a force for good within our economies. All indicators tell us that migration is essential due to the shrinking native workforce as a result of falling birth rates. Rather, we cannot afford to allow the discourse around migration to be hijacked by small-minded perspectives of populist protectionism. It is time for us to be proactive and forward-thinking in our policies. We must allow the full benefits of migration to outweigh any short-term challenges. In the words of Ian Golden, Professor of Globalization and Development at the University of Oxford, he said, migration has always been one of the most important drivers of human progress and dynamism. End quote. Therefore, let us keep ourselves on the right side of history. Let me urge us all and our, and our authorities and civil societies to work together to find more effective ways of managing migration, thereby ensuring sustainable peace, long-term prosperity, and meaningful well-being for all the peoples of our nation and all of humanity. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>